All right, go ahead and open up the election of Andrew Jackson notes. the election of Andrew Jackson notes. Make sure you're on the notes and you're not on a video game. All right, so up until then, we've talked about the founding fathers, the first five presidents of the United States who were all founding fathers. And something that they all had in common is that they all belonged to the rich and they all belonged to the elite class. Okay. And at a certain time period, the rich didn't equal with the middle, the middle class, the commoners. That just wasn't a thing. Okay. But that was the old generation of politicians and of congressmen. Now there's a new generation of congressmen, politicians, and leaders. And instead of being from the East Coast, where the old generation is from, they're now here in the frontier. Why is this area the frontier? Can anyone tell me why this area in the South is the frontier? Why isn't this the frontier over here? What does the frontier mean? Do we know what a frontier means? Okay, you're going to look it up. Thank you. I'll give you a hint. This area is not the frontier because it's already established. They have buildings, cities, roads, highways. Why would this area be the frontier? It's all rural, right? We just bought this area not that long ago. So technically, this is all the wild. The frontier, make sure you're paying attention. The frontier is the border of the country, right? So these new generation of politicians are all from the frontier, like Kentucky and Tennessee, right? Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana just became a new state. So this new generation of politicians are not like the old generation. They're not like the founding fathers. They're rough, they're rugged. Um, they're often called uh, trashy people because they don't have the same class as these old people did, right? They don't have manners like these old people did. They're, um, they're a lot different, right? They're from the wild. They're from the rough area of town, I mean, of the country. So we all know Davy Crockett from Texas history. Davy Crockett was one of those politicians from Tennessee, right? He was a frontiersman. He was rough. He was rugged. He um, didn't have time for that city, those city manners or those city city folks, right? Another leader is called Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson is also from Tennessee, and he'll make a mark on um, in government. Andrew Jackson is a lot different than the original founding fathers. Remember, the original founding fathers they were all elite, they were rich, they were all well educated. Um, they didn't get dirty, right? Andrew Jackson, he's from the frontier. He's rough. He's a wild man. He doesn't mind getting his hands dirty. He's for the common people. He doesn't care for the rich. He doesn't care for the elite. In fact, he thinks that the elite and the rich shouldn't be in control of government. That the common man, the common person, should be in control of government. All right. Let's go ahead and watch this video of Andrew Jackson and his presidency. In 1835, someone tried to shoot Andrew Jackson. The president, who was 67, beat the guy senseless with his cane. You don't mess with Andrew Jackson. Born in 1767 in the Carolinas, Jackson grew up poor and tough as nails. He made a fortune in Tennessee as a lawyer and a landowner, then became a national hero in 1815 by whooping the British as the general at the Battle of New Orleans. He won the presidency in 1828, and he changed everything. Jackson believed the president was the direct representative of the common man. Like Thomas Jefferson, he wanted to keep the federal government weak and let the states have their 
USA. Unlike Jefferson, he thought the best way to do that was a strong president. Earlier presidents vetoed bills only when they were unconstitutional. Jackson vetoed bills he didn't like. He blocked infrastructure projects, dismantled the National Bank, and replaced government employees with political friends. He went against the Supreme Court and had the Native Americans removed from their land in the South. He also took on his own vice president, John Calhoun, over tariffs. Enemies called him King Andrew and formed the Whig Party to take him on. Jackson left office in 1837, but he changed politics forever. And if you try to stay different, the ghost of Andrew Jackson will kick your you-know-what. <laughs> had a big hatred for the British, right? So anyway, he grows up, he moves to Tennessee as an orphan. He's an orphan by age 14. And um, he becomes a lawyer on his own, he eventually gets himself a plantation and becomes a well-respected congressman. And not only that, he enlists in the army and he becomes a general at the Battle of New Orleans. The Battle of New Orleans, he became very famous for defeating the British. Remember, he hates the British, right? After that, he tries to invade Spain because um, Spanish Florida, because the Seminole Indians were there, and he didn't like Native Americans much, and so he would go into Florida and attack the Native Americans. Obviously, that became an issue because Florida belonged to Spain. So James Monroe, who was the president at the time, had to buy Florida from Spain in order to avoid a war. And so after Florida was bought from Spain, Monroe made Jackson the the territorial governor of Florida territory. So anyway, Jackson's a very, very famous person at this time, and he has a lot of experience in politics and government, right? My teachers and students, please release for B lunch. It's now B lunch. So the presidency of James Monroe comes to an end in 1825. That's the end of the early republic. But before he can leave office, there's an election, the election of 1824, okay? So there were four people running for president. There was John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams, the second president, Andrew Jackson, William H. Crawford, and Henry Clay. You remember Henry Clay from Congress, who was a war hawk? By now, Henry Clay is very respected, and he is the Speaker of the House of Representatives. That means he leads the House of Representatives. So all of these people are Democratic Republicans because during the era of good feelings, the Federalists aren't around. There's only one party. But the election came to a tie. And it really was tied between Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams. Even though Jackson technically won the majority of votes, um, the electoral and popular votes, he didn't have 131 votes. And at that time, he needed 131 electoral votes to win. So he got 99 electoral votes, John Quincy Adams got 84. So both of these guys were technically tied for president. So the question asked, why did no candidate immediately win the election of 1828? The election came to a tie. The election came to a tie. We all get the last bullet, the last. Hmm? Anybody help getting caught up? So again, they come to a tie. Obviously, people from Tennessee, his home state, and a lot of the Old South, they vote for him. Why do a lot of people in New England vote for John Quincy Adams? They can relate to him. Where's John Quincy Adams from? He's from where his father's from. 
Am I remember where John Adams is from? Whoa, John Adams was the only one not from Virginia. Massachusetts, right? So if he's from Massachusetts, a lot of people in New England are going to vote for him. All right. So it comes down to a tie. And because no candidate won the election, the US Constitution says the House of Representatives would choose the next president. So now it's up to the House of Representatives to break the tie and vote for the next president. Even though Andrew Jackson won the most electoral and popular votes, they still voted for John Quincy Adams to become the president of the United States. So John Quincy Adams is elected the sixth president of the United States. But there is a story behind it. Henry Clay, who was Speaker of the House, he encouraged many representatives to vote for Adams because John Adams would support the laws that Henry Clay wanted to pass in the House of Representatives. Henry Clay had this thing called the American system, and that would build roads, canals, tunnels, bridges out in the West where Henry Clay's from. Henry Clay knew Andrew Jackson would not support his policy, the laws he wanted to pass. Jackson would not uh, support Henry Clay's American system. But he knew that Adams would support the American system. So he encouraged people in the House of Representatives to vote for Adams. And so after Adams became president, he made Henry Clay his Secretary of State. Kind of like, you help me get here, let me help you by putting you in this high position, the Secretary of State. That looks a little sketchy, right? It's kind of like um, Henry Clay helped out Adams, now Adams is going to help out Henry Clay. How do you think Jackson feels about that? What do you think? Uh, Dad? He didn't win. Matt, do you think he feels like he was cheated out of it? Like he should really be president? That's how he feels. So Jackson, who lost, calls this the corrupt bargain. He said that deal between Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams is a corrupt bargain. What's a bargain? It's a deal, right? What's corrupt? What's corrupt? I mean, like, what, what, is, what does corrupt mean? What does corrupt mean? Is it a good thing? It's kind of like a bad thing, right? It's like immoral, right? He says this is like an immoral deal. He said this is exactly the reason that I say the government is corrupt, because of things like this. So Jackson uses this to his advantage. And he makes a case that the government is just corrupt. So why did Jackson call the deal between Clay and Adams a corrupt bargain? Because Adams rewarded Clay for encouraging the House of Representatives to vote for him as president. And Jackson felt cheated. Jackson felt cheated out of the presidency. So if you remember Henry Clay's American system, that meant that they would the country would raise tariffs and encourage people to buy from New England industry, New England factories, right? And they would use that tariff money to build roads, canals, bridges out here in the West. Okay, that sounds like a great thing. So John Quincy Adams sticks to supporting Henry Clay's American system. And John Quincy Adams, as president, tries to pass a lot of those laws. He tries to get roads and canals and bridges built out in the Western frontier. 
except Andrew Jackson still a part of Congress. And Andrew Jackson still angry and upset that he didn't win the election because of the corrupt bargains. And he gets a lot of his um, followers in Congress to block a lot of the laws that John Quincy Adams tried to pass. So because of that, John Quincy Adams doesn't get, get, get a lot done as president. So John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States and served from 1825 until 1829. That is one term. He was a Democratic Republican from Massachusetts and was the son of the second president, John Adams, who was the president of the XYZ affair and the Alien and Sedition Act. I think it's just uh, ironic that both John Adams and John Quincy Adams, one term. Previously, John Quincy Adams was a professor at Harvard University. He was a US diplomat to Holland, Prussia, Great Britain, and Russia. He was the Secretary of State under James Monroe and was the brains behind the Monroe Doctrine and the adams onese Treaty. So after his presidency, this is what's important, after his presidency, he served in the House of Representatives from 1831 until his death in 1848. Believe it or not, that's what the state of Texas wants you to know. After his presidency, he served in the House of Representatives from 1831 until his death in 1848. And again, he doesn't get a lot done as president because Andrew Jackson, who has a lot of followers in Congress, he gets a lot of laws blocked. After this, after this election, Andrew Jackson's only goal is to prevent John Quincy Adams from doing anything. Go ahead and watch this video on John Quincy Adams' presidency. <laughs> John Quincy Adams served his country from boyhood until literally the day he died. Born in 1767 near Boston, he wasn't even a pimple-faced teen when his dad took him to Europe as a personal assistant on diplomatic missions. He grew up to be America's best ambassador and its worst smiler. He was a hit as Monroe's Secretary of State, but he wasn't a lock for president in 1824. There were four candidates, including Andrew Jackson, but no one got enough votes to win outright. The House of Representatives voted and chose Adams for president. Why the House of Representatives voted for Adams is the big problem. In what was called a corrupt bargain, Adams made Henry Clay, the Speaker of the House, his Secretary of State, apparently in exchange for Clay supporting Adams. JQA was an honest guy, but it looked like a bribe. And Andrew Jackson, who got the most votes, was the sorest loser ever and helped make Adams' presidency miserable. Adams supported Clay's plan, called the American System. It involved building roads, canals, a national university, and more. Jackson also had a plan. It involved all his pals in Congress blocking everything Adams wanted. Jackson won their rematch in 1828, but Adams won a House seat in 1830 and helped lead the anti-slavery movement. In 1848, he had a stroke on the House floor and died. Hey, retirement's not for everybody. All right, so why did, what did John Quincy Adams do after he served president? A president he became a congressman from 1831 to 1848 and led the anti slavery movement under the Adams. Became a congressman from 1831 to 1848 and led the anti slavery movement. Did he like slavery? No, he was against it. He was trying to get laws passed to get rid of slavery. Because he's from the north, exactly. He's from Massachusetts. 
and they don't really want to use it. Alright. The election of 1828. In 1828, Jackson ran against Adams, but this time with a heavy campaign. His campaign team organized the events, newspapers, and clubs around the country to support Jackson. So this time, Andrew Jackson didn't come to play, he came to win. He presented himself as the common man's president, unlike Adams, who supported the rich and the elite. So remember, John Quincy Adams is all about the rich and the elite. Andrew Jackson is about the common man. So the middle class, the low class. Jackson and his supporters, they split from the Democratic Republican Party. And they created their own political party. They became known as the Jacksonian Democrats. That is the same Democratic Party we have today. This is where today's Democratic Party is born from the Jacksonian Democrats. In the end, Andrew Jackson gained more than twice as many electoral votes than John Quincy Adams. And so here's Andrew Jackson's background. He served as seventh president from 1829 until 1837. And he was given the nickname Old Hickory because he was supposed to be as tough as a hickory tree. And he was famous for the Battle of New Orleans. So he's this tough, rugged guy, right? He doesn't care about the rich folk. He cares about the common man. That's the, the normal people. What, what does the common man include? Does, it, does the common man include women? Yes or no? No. Does the common man include people of color? No. So again, he's this tough person. In fact, the first presidential assassination attempt happened during his presidency. So somebody tried to assassinate him, but the gun misfired twice. Andrew Jackson was angry and grabbed his cane and he beat the guy. So he's this like tough guy, right? All right, so remind me, back then, what was one of the, the requirements that were needed to vote? Right, mail and own land, right? So in the election of 1824, that was a requirement in a lot of states. You have to own land. Well, Jackson was like, well, the common man doesn't own land. So Jackson got a lot of states. He pushed and encouraged a lot of states to get rid of that rule. So eventually, more and more states got rid of the requirement to own land. So let me show you something. In the election of 1824, Jackson got 151,000 votes. John Quincy Adams got 113,000 votes. And then John Quincy Adams still won the election, right? In the election of 1828, Jackson got 642,000 votes. John Quincy Adams got 500,000 votes. Why is there a dramatic increase in voting between 1824 until 1828? Yeah, so you don't have to own land anymore. So now all of a sudden, these people who weren't allowed to vote because they didn't own land, now they came out to vote because in this election, you don't have to own land anymore, right? And this includes white land owning, white males who and it doesn't matter if you own land so obviously a majority of them voted for jackson because he made it possible for them he supported the suffrage or he supported their suffrage what does suffrage mean suffrage means the right to vote so he's inaugurated in um, 1829 that means he becomes president and takes the oath 
And after his inauguration, he invites everyone over to the White House. It doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, middle class. Everyone is allowed to come into the White House to um, celebrate the victory. And so this has never happened before. So you have all these people from every class in the, the American society just rushing into the White House. And there was a critic, there were a lot of critics because this wasn't tradition, this wasn't what they were used to. They said that this was the beginning of the reign of King Mob. So they said that Jackson was this trashy person who was the king of the mobs. So what kind of people champion Jackson? The common man. That is white males back then. The historical term for the common man at that period was white males. Did he care about the rich? No. Did he care about the educated and the elite? No. So when he becomes president, he introduces the spoil system. After Jackson was elected, he fired many government workers and cabinet members, and then he replaced them with his own supporters and his own friends. That became known as the spoil system, which was Jackson's system of replacing government office holders with those loyal to him. So they're all Democrats. He, he put Democrats in office. So one of Jackson's supporters said, to the victor belong the spoils. To the victor belongs the spoils. What do you think that means? What is a spoil? What's a spoil? It's not like bad food, but what's spoil? You get, what do you get spoiled with? Things, get prizes, right? So another word for prize is a spoil. To the victor belongs the spoil. What does that mean? It means that the winner has a right to the spoil or the prize of victory, right? So because Jackson won, because he is the winner, he has a right to the prize of victory, which means putting anybody he wants in office in the cabinet. He has a right, according to him, he has a right to put any of his friends in um, a different position in the government. Y'all get this down? Do you agree with the spoil system? Yes or no? No, why not? It's making it personal. What else? He's, he's using his presidency as an advantage. So you're saying if you became, I don't know, the CEO of a company, you wouldn't put your friends in positions higher up? I mean, if they deserve it. If they're good at it, they experience it, they deserve it. You'd create new positions. You wouldn't. Why do you think Jackson did it? Do you think he was doing it to be a jerk, or do you think he had a reason? Yeah, because he wanted what did you say? They voted against him. What kind of people were he against? Rich, the elite. All of these people right here had rich and elite people in office. So according to him, he felt that the original the elite had gotten too comfortable in government. So he felt that a regular rotation of government officials, so regularly replacing people was necessary, and that ordinary Americans could get the job done. Personally, I wouldn't put nobody in office unless I knew they were capable.
All right. Let's look at this cartoon real quick. This cartoon is called Office Hunters. So who do you see here? That's Andrew Jackson. And he's dangling things above people who are jumping up for them. What do you think he's dangling? Jobs. 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 Yeah, basically that. He's dangling jobs or the spoils of his winning. He, he's uh, dangling these above these um, people looking for jobs, right? These are all supporters of his. Do you think this person, the author of this cartoon, likes Jackson? No. They, they made him into Satan. Yeah. yeah. All right, so Jacksonian democracy. In the years of early of the United States, um, only the white landowning males could vote. So remember, the old generation believed that only the rich and the elite were educated enough to make decisions. So the founding fathers really believed that. They were creating the Constitution that only the rich and educated should make the decisions because the common man then they have a good enough education to make decisions on their own. I mean, at that time period, the majority of the country didn't know how to read. So that pretty much only meant the rich could vote and make decisions in government. Andrew Jackson didn't believe in that. Jackson believed that all white men should vote, even if they did not own land and were poor. He thought that all white men should gain suffrage. What do we say suffrage means? That's the right to vote. Suffrage means the right to vote. So he wanted to expand suffrage to all white men. So if I was alive back then, would I be able to vote? To be honest, yes or no? No, I wouldn't be able to vote, right? Hispanic. He called for states to give all white men the right to vote. Eventually, more and more states granted them the right to vote. In turn, Jackson was helping out the common man. Jackson believed that the common man should be controlling government, not the rich and elite. So he became known as the people's president because of this. He said he was for the people. So this is Jacksonian democracy. Jackson's idea of spreading power to all people. Why did Jackson become known as the people's president? What do we think? He was for the people. What else? He thought that the common man should have a say. Anybody else? Tell me you said something. For the people, right? So he thought that the common man should have a bigger say in government, not the rich elite. Not the minority. I think we all agree that the rich and the elite is just a small population of the country. He felt that the majority of the population should have a say, not the minority. All right. The so approval rating of Jackson so far one out of 10. Zero. Zero. Anybody else? Six. So far, four. four. Tell me why. Why do you think six? I don't know. I was trying to do what's right. I think it's hard, but at the same time, it's like Okay. Why do you think four? Yeah, mixed feelings. Mixed feelings so far? You said zero. Why do you think zero? Oh, no, I changed it. Change it. What do you change it to? 
Why six and a half, six point five? You don't know about it. Okay. Anybody else? You buy because you're neutral. Six or seven. Do you like it so far? Why? Let's look at this from a historical point of view rather than from modern. It's just like it's unfair. Unfair. No, I'm saying that's what I don't like. Do you think he can take things too personally? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Like, especially blocking John Quincy Adams from doing a lot of things. That was really personal, right? All right, go ahead. You have a knowledge check to complete. That's going to be your daily grade. Don't use your notes. Do not use your notes. Complete your knowledge check. You get three attempts. You need to make at least a 70. Be done with it. At least a 70. You get three attempts. Three. Don't use your notes. Close the notes. Finish your notes. Close them. If you get to the second attempt and you still don't make a 70, come and see me. <laughs>